Today's lecture is about process automation. Um, we are already more than halfway through the BPM lifecycle, past process analysis, process redesign. We are gonna see today, how do we take um, a process model like the ones you have been designing until now, which are, I would call them conceptual process models. They allow you to, they are meant for communicating with other stakeholders. When you were drawing this business process, it was to understand the process, to give some structure to the process, to document it, to communicate it. And uh, this type of process models are very often used in companies to answer questions such as, oh, we have a new employee and he's gonna, this new employee, she's gonna work in this business process. You know, how do we explain to this new employee how the process works? Uh, and what are the steps and who does them? And so that the new employee has uh, an understanding of what, uh, how their work fits within the bigger picture uh, and why things are done in a certain way. Um, these the same uh, process models that we have been designed, you have seen, we can use them in order to do value added analysis, waste analysis, uh, in order to, um, a, a do simulation or quantitative analysis or queuing theory in some cases. We can also use them to then explain how we are gonna change the process. And then once you have done that, there are two ways of implementing your process. Sometimes your business process is executed entirely on a single information system. Like for example, on top of an SAP system or on top of an Oracle financial systems. Well, when that happens, well, you obviously, what you do is that you configure your enterprise resource planning system or your customer relationship planning system so that it enforces the process, so that it supports and enforces the business process you have at hand. Sometimes, however, um, your, uh, your business process spans across several systems. And it may be that some of the tasks in the process, for example, involves someone doing something, for example, on a, on a spreadsheet. Uh, other tasks in your process involve somebody doing something with your enterprise system or with your CRM system. Another step in the process might involve uh, replying to a request from a customer. And this is not done through the system, but maybe it's done via phone, et cetera. So there are many different types of tasks that need to be done in the process and not all of them are supported by the same information system. So you need a machine um, that, well, you can do it two ways. You either just tell people do it in whatever way you want, but in more structured organizations, one way you can automate processes that span across multiple organizations is by preparing that process to be deployed into some execution system, usually called a business process management system or a document management system or other type of similar system. And that system will coordinate all the tasks in the process, will make sure that it communicates with the enterprise system, like the ERP system when it has to, that it gives tasks to the right people when it has to, and it will be always able to tell you what is the current state of every instance of your business process. To get a process model to the level where you can deploy it in a business process management system, you do have to refine it. It's not like I take my process model that I have shown you until now with the activities and the flows and the gateways, and I just put it into a BPMS, there are a certain number of, of refinements of that process model that you have to do if you want to do it, make it what I would call executable process, an executable process. And, and today I'm gonna introduce to you a systematic method. And at the end, I'm gonna give you a sheet sheet that you can use to take a process model of any complexity, a conceptual process model and make it ready to be executed by a workflow system or a, by a business process management systems. I'm gonna to try to introduce these principles first in a way that is completely independent of a tool. And then I will show you more concretely 
how this looks like in the context of the Camunda uh, business process management system. So there are five steps that we will follow. Um, let me just enumerate them. So we will first identify what part of the process are we going to automate because the business process can be pretty long. So, and maybe we only want to automate in a business process management system part of that process that happens very often. Maybe part of it is already automated by some other system and we'll leave it out. Or maybe part of it is none of our concern because it's a process that is executed by somebody else in another organization. In that case, we will not touch it. We will then start looking what to do with manual tasks because there are some tasks that are not done in front of the computer that are not digitized. So we have to think about like, how do we link those tasks into your business process or do you, we just ignore them? In the third step, we are gonna refine a bit the process model in order to make sure that we have identified different common types of exceptions and that we have some mechanisms for handling those exceptions. Because, you know, the drawback of automation is always exceptions. You know, what will happen if something um, deviates with respect to the normal execution flow? So we need to spend some time to, to think about those potential exceptions as much as possible. Of course, further exceptions will arise on the road, but we need to try to preempt as many exceptions as possible. And finally, we need to specify certain uh, additional information for every task and every gateway in the process model. Uh, we need to add some additional information so that we explain to the system how it needs to interact uh, with the different stakeholders or, or when, when the system gets to an XOR gateway, uh, under what conditions should we go left or right? I mean, the, the automated system needs to know this. So five steps, we need to go through five steps. To illustrate it, let me take this um, example. It's a loan application handling. A... No, sorry, it's an order to cash example. This is a bit more realistic than the one that we have been seeing until now. We have been seeing these little ones now I will explain you how things look like when you have like a, a larger process. I try to put it in a single diagram because PowerPoint doesn't provide an easy way of showing you multiples of processes. But imagine that in practice, this, this process will be split into multiples of processes. So this is an order to cash process. I first need to define what are my automation boundaries. I am... Um, I'm a consultant. I am working for the company that sells products, that is executing this business process in order to sell products to customers and that interact with suppliers. So naturally, um, I will not go and automate what happens on the side of the customer, and I will not go and automate what happens on the side of the suppliers. I need to find out how to integrate with their information systems, but I don't need to go and automate their process. So I'm going to scope my automation project to this part of the process, to one pool. And this is very important. Whenever you go to a business process management system and you try to make a process model executable, it has to be a single pool process. You have to choose which pool are you going to automate. That is going to be your scope. So this is a process that starts when I receive the stock availability. This is just to make you understand what type of tasks there are. So I receive a, a purchase order. I check if it is available. Let's, let's follow the, 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 the happy path where, yes, it is available. Uh, therefore, I need to retrieve the product from the warehouse uh, packet. I need to confirm the order to the customer. Uh, of course, there are some exceptional paths where the stock is not available. If it is not available, I need to um, handle, find that product somewhere in the warehouse. Uh, let's say I don't have the product, but I have the components to, to compose the product, to, to manufacture the product. So I retrieve those raw materials from one of my suppliers and I manufacture the product on demand. And then I'm ready to ship the product at that point in time. Uh, I confirm the order to the, to the customer 
And then I get the shipping address of the customer, possibly from an information system. So I'll interact with an information system to grab the, the shipping address of the customer. And I'm going to ship the goods. Um, in parallel, of course, I need to take care of the invoice. So I will retrieve the invoicing details of this customer and I will send them a, a, a corresponding invoice. So first thing, not all parts of the process can be automated. You know, in that respect, there are in BPMN three categories of tasks. There are automated tasks. So tasks that the, the automated system will perform automatically, it will not need any human intervention. So automated task means no human intervention. There are user tasks. User tasks are tasks that are performed by a person called a user interacting with a computer system. So those are user tasks. So it doesn't mean they are manual nor automated, they are hybrid. It involves one person interacting with a system. And then there are manual tasks in BPMN and manual tasks are really those that are not done with a computer. So you do them offline, let's say, and then maybe later you will report them in the system. At a more fine grained level of details, in BPMN, there are six types of tasks. Four of them are in the category of automated tasks, no human intervention. One of them is the user task, which is like a task that requires human intervention, but that involves a computer system as well. And finally, there are manual tasks which only involve um, a, a human and does not involve any machine. The automated tasks uh, are um, uh, service tasks. Uh, service is with reference to something called a web service. In the IT jargon, a web service is um, a point, a system that allows you to make a call via the network, typically via HTTP protocol, so via the network, so, so that one program can call a function in another system by means of some well-exposed functionality that's called a web service usually. And a service task in the APMN is simply a task that when it is executed, will make the system that is executing this BPMN model call an external service, possibly get a response and then continue. All this without human intervention. Then there are script tasks in BPMN. A script tasks means that I will, a developer typically, will write a program and they will put it inside the task and they will associate it with the task. And that is a script, a little program that for example, will do a calculation. Like for example, if you wanted to do like a, a, a tax calculation. So you put a, a, um, a task that will calculate the VAT on an invoice um, and, and it's implemented as a script. As an alternative to it being implemented by means of calling an external system somewhere else through the network, you know, you can put a little program that computes it inside that task. And the two other automated tasks are the send task and the receive task, the, which you denote by putting envelopes. Black envelope means it's a send. White envelope means it's a receive task. Uh, the send task is a task that does nothing else than sending a message via computer system. Like for example, sending through an email, but without human intervention, like an automated email, or uh, sending through a, a message to some external system somewhere else, for example, through an electronic data interchange link. And <clears throat> the receive task <coughs> is the reverse. It's a task where the system that is executing the process stops, it waits for some message, and when it receives the message, it continues. Finally, user tasks are the tasks that are performed by a human user interacting with a computer system. And a manual task is a task that the computer doesn't see because it's entirely executed offline. So let me illustrate this 
using the uh, working example. So we receive a purchase order. Of course, that's, that's a message. That's a message received. And the first thing we do is to check the stock availability. Uh, stocks, the, the stock, I mean, with what, what do we have currently in our inventory? That is usually managed by an enterprise resource planning system. It's one of the main functions that an enterprise resource planning system will provide. So to execute the task, the business process management system will typically just make a service call to the enterprise resource planning system because all ERP systems nowadays offer some application programming interface where you can call them. So it automatically calls the system with, for example, the ID of the product and the amount that needs to be reserved and the system will tell him, will tell, get back and say, yes, we have it available or no, we don't have it available. So now I know, you know, the system knows whether the product is available in the inventory or not. Let's, uh, if it's not available, then we uh, check if, well, this particular product is not available, but maybe we have the materials available to produce it. Um, and that's a call to, um, to uh, an enterprise resource planning system. And because it's also a call to a resource planning system to check if we have the product available, then it's a service task. Another example of a service task in here is uh, the task of uh, manufacturing the product. You will ask me, oh, whoa, well, manufacturing the product is not an electronic task, right? Well, but nowadays um, in factories, they have an, a type of system called manufacturing execution system. So the production lines are, are managed by means of that software that communicates with the, with the hardware, with the production line, and orders are sent to that manufacturing execution system uh, via a programmatic interface, via web service, and uh, the manufacturing execution system then schedules uh, the work to produce that particular order. So in that sense, and assuming that there is such a manufacturing execution system in the company, then this will be a service task. A two other automated tasks, this type of type receive, are the tasks of receiving, um, of type send, sorry, send the tasks are the task of requesting the raw materials from one supplier, supplier number one, and requesting the raw material from supplier number two. Uh, they are received tasks, sent tasks, because my system needs to send a message to the supplier, but it's not a service task because we only send a message, we do not wait for a response. In a service task, there is the idea that I interact with the system and it gives me back at the response, a send task is rather like I send a message and I do not expect to get a response straight away. But eventually, there will be a response, for example, in the form of the raw materials will arrive. Now, this, tool, this task of receiving the raw material is something that happens in the warehouse of the company. Uh, so in the warehouse, the trucks arrive and ah, here are the products that you ordered. Now, somebody now has to grab that, those, those boxes and put them uh, in the production line or close to the production line so that the production can start. That movement is usually a manual task, um, unless, of course, the warehouse is digitized, and I will get to that a little bit later. So, but if the warehouse is not digitized, this task of moving the product from the truck to the production line is a manual task. So I mark them in BPMN with the symbol, this is a manual task. If I continue, I can see that a confirm order is a user task. So once the products have been, are available or have been produced, I need to tell to the customer, Yes, we will deliver and we will deliver at this point in time and we'll deliver this and this and this products on this date and this and this products on this other date. That requires a human to 
understand what is the current situation. Okay, we produce these products. How many of them did we produce? Or we receive these products when we will be able to produce them. So the, the, the a user needs to be involved to decide what to respond to the customer. So it is a user task that will be performed probably by somebody in the sales department or in the customer service department. By, but it's not manual because that user will do it in front of a computer system. So we mark it as a user task, not as a manual task. And so on, the other tasks in the, in the system, I'm gonna spare to you, but I just wanted to cover the different types of tasks uh, that you will find in BPMN. Uh, service tasks, send and receive tasks, those are automated. User tasks, this is manual, but it involves interaction between a human and a computer. Manual tasks, those ones are purely manual tasks. Then second step is to review what do we do with manual tasks? I want to automatically to ex coordinate the execution of a business process end to end by means of a system, an information system. But there are some tasks that are done offline. So what do I do with tasks that are done offline? Well, the obvious thing is to find a way of supporting or recording those tasks in the information system, in the IT system. Maybe you are gonna say, okay, every time that a new order arrives from a truck, the person at the warehouse immediately needs to scan the barcode and enter some details about the arrival into a computer system and mark it as, yes, we received these products before putting them into the shelves. So that's one way of automating this task of um, uh, retrieving products from the warehouse. Uh, so, the manual task, in a way, became an automated task, you know, by having a user like, go and, and scan every time something arrives. So it's not entirely done offline. The computer system knows that something happens. The, and then the, the, the business process execution system can realize, yes, the products have now arrived. Um, there can be some more fancy ways of automating this task. Um, uh, for example, nowadays, um, but if you have a large volume warehouse, um, you will notice that nowadays there's a lot of automation in those warehouses. Stuff is done by robots. So robots pick products at the entrance of the warehouse and go and put them in different shelves and vice versa. When we have such systems that are then coordinated by um, uh, uh, an information system, then we can uh, uh, transform that previously manual task of moving, moving products into the warehouse, we, can we are effectively transforming them into an automated task where the system just sends an order to the system to go and retrieve some products and then receives the notification that the products are already in the shelves from the warehouse management system. Of course, there is another way fallback option to deal with manual tasks, and that's just to leave them out of the automated process, to just trust that people do them. And, but then we do not know when they do it or, or uh, how much time it takes, etc. We just leave them in the process. That's the fallback options that you adopt when you are, when you are unable really to um, uh, connect the, uh, the, the, the execution of the task with your information system. But this is done less and less. Today, organizations understand the power of knowing exactly what is the state of every asset or every product in the organization. And they will typically require uh, that there are no manual tasks, but they are somehow registered in the information system in one way or another. The third step towards turning a, a process model, a conceptual process model into an executable process model is to complete it, to fill in the dots. One thing is when you design an executable, an, a, a conceptual model, you probably have left a lot of little exceptions out of the equation. 
When you want to make that process executable, you have to think a little bit more about those exceptions. You need to think about what, ha what happens if this, what happens if that. Um, so there is an effort that analysts will do when they automate, when they prepare a process for automation, which is to think step by step, gateway by gateway about the possible exceptions that might happen. If I send something, what if I do not receive a response within 48 hours or within 72 hours? What are we going to do about it? That's a typical type of questions that you will ask as an analyst when you are trying to prepare a, a, a process model for automation. Um, the, the other thing that you need to think about is for every task, you need to carefully think about what is the data that it needs as input and what is the data that it needs as output. Because when you will design the screens to execute the user tasks in the process, you need to know exactly what data you need to display to the user to perform their work and what data should the user give to you, should you record from the user when the user performs the task. So there is typically together with an executor, a project of converting, a, a, of automating a process, there is a huge effort of data modeling in parallel, trying to capture all the data that needs to be used by the users who perform tasks in the business process. And that's what this step is about. In this particular example, for example, there is um, a task called a check stock availability, sorry, check raw material availability. So we are checking which supplier has the raw material and by which date they are able to deliver the raw material to us in order to manufacture this product that a customer has ordered to us. Immediately as an analyst, you have to have the reflex of asking, so, and what if none of the suppliers has this product available in stock in the near term? So what do we do? We need to introduce a new task to communicate with the customer that we are not able to deliver by the date that they requested and to try to then negotiate with the customer a later delivery date. Similarly, we look at the task check stock availability and we need to think carefully what input does it take? For example, of course, it takes the purchase order because it needs to know the product ID that needs to be ordered. And also uh, we need to record whether or not the stock is available and in which shelf of which warehouse it is available so that the user who is gonna go and retrieve that product from the warehouse has a good idea of, you know, we can, the system can tell to that user where to find that product in the warehouse and we can execute this task faster, the task of retrieving the product from the warehouse. And I need to go task by task and think carefully about what is the output of every task? What is the input of every task? And what is the output of every task? That then takes me to the fourth, the fourth step in going from a conceptual process model to an executable process model, um, which is to uh, make sure that the tasks are at the right level of granularity because a, a too fine-graded task will means that the users have to do too many steps in the process. Too coarse-graded task might mean that uh, I am mixing up work from different workers. So the one thing that we need to do when we go to, um, to uh, a, an executable process model is make sure you have eliminated salami tasks. Salami task is a term I use to refer to little steps, tasks that are not tasks, but rather steps, little steps, consecutive steps performed by the same person. So it is not very convenient for a user to perform a task uh, eh, by, you know, I do a little bit and then in another screen, I do a little bit and in another screen, I do a little bit. So you want to put all this, if I need, if I as a user need to perform a piece of work, it's better that you give it to me in a single go and then I decide how to perform this task. 
rather than you give me the task by little steps, do this, now do this, now do this. Because of that, it's recommended that if you have multiple tasks performed by the same person, consecutive tasks, I'm, I'm talking about consecutive tasks, one after the other, you should merge them into a single one. And then uh, conversely, if a given task involves more than two people, it is also recommended practice to split that task into two separate tasks. One is performed by one person and the other is performed by another person. Um, why so that? Because you have to assume that these two people might not be available exactly at the same time. If you really need to bring two people together at the same time, sure, you can assign a task to an entire team, but if the task the separate steps of the task can be executed. If people can do them in their own time, then it's better to separate them, to avoid having to synchronize people more than it is needed. That tends to make your process actually faster than if you try to synchronize everything, because it's very difficult to put, you know, synchronize multiple people to get uh, something done in a single go. An exception to the rule, um, however, is when you have multiple consecutive tasks performed by the same person, but they need to be performed for some reason on different days or at different points in time, then don't merge them. For example, I have here an example where I post, somebody post the documents to some external party and Five days later, they receive a response. And then uh, sometime later, they update the student record. Of course, you cannot merge these tasks because they are performed at different dates, at different times. Maybe the last two tasks in here, receiving the results and updating the student record, those could be merged, uh, but you cannot merge the first two tasks because they are like five days apart. That's just common sense. So if I take my process model, this is how it looked at the beginning. And once I have applied all these steps of tagging every task with its type, of uh, refining the process to capture exceptions, of um, refactoring manual tasks, etc. Then after applying these steps, I get a much more complete um, a process model annotated with task types that, and with different types of exceptions that I am now ready to render executable. So the fifth step is uh, to take, to specify the execution properties. Um, you need to provide information about how each task will be performing the process and what business rules will be used to execute every gateway in your process. So we need to specify, depending on the system, on the business process management system or the automation system or the workflow system that we are using, we are gonna have to specify different types of uh, execution properties. We Sometimes we need to specify variables, message types, signal types, error types. We need to specify uh, which, what is the input of every task and what is the output of every task. Some systems like Amunda will allow, will tell, will, will allow you to define fields in a task. And those fields can be input fields like, um, a editable fields or output fields, which means they are um, not editable. They just show you information, but you cannot modify them. Then you have to, if you have service tasks, you need to specify, you not necessarily you, but the IT person um, a, or the IT, the IT team member needs to specify the details to connect the task with the external information system. You need to specify uh, your codes, uh, code snippets uh, for your scripts. If you have a script task, you need to put the program, the script to execute it. Um, you need to then specify 
in the case of user tasks, who is able to perform it? Because for example, if I have a task called inform user in my process, not everybody in the organization can do it. Only a subset of people of a certain group or team are able to do it. So you have to specify, okay, this task can be executed by this group. Um, uh, and then for every, uh, if you have an XOR gateway, you need to specify under what conditions, on which variables in the process are you able to go left or right in your process. So it's pretty, pretty daunting. At this stage, I just wanted to give you an overview of this five steps process so that you keep it in mind. This is, is the process that you're gonna follow as you do your, 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 your homework for in the, your process automation homework, which I will release uh, a, a next week. Um, and, uh, a, and now I'm gonna make it a little bit concrete. Uh, I'm gonna to introduce you the concept of a business process management system, how it looks like at the architecture level. And then I'm gonna show you concretely uh, how you specify a small executable process in a one particular business process management system called Camunda. So a business process management system, which is closely related to something called a workflow management system, uh, is um, a type of information system that allows you to capture processes in some notation, for example, a, in a, a business process modeling notation like BPMN, uh, but other systems will support other types of notations. Um, for example, there are systems called robotic process automation systems, RPA systems, that allow you to specify not processes, but tasks using certain types of scripts, typically visual scripts. The process modeling tool uh, allows is something you have already seen. You have seen uh, a, a, you know, a process modeling tool in a promoter that allows you to uh, uh, capture your process diagram and uh, add the gateways and specify the types of gateways and uh, annotate different parts of the process. Uh, it allows you to capture the, the, the tasks, the gateways and all the properties associated to these tasks and gateways. The second component in a business process management system is the execution engine. So from the process, the process model is deployed into a so-called execution engine, which receives this BPMN model. And if it has sufficient information in it, this execution engine is able to automate it in the sense of you know, uh, invoking external systems, giving work to different users, tracking that work, making sure that when somebody completes their task, the next person gets their task in their in-tray, et cetera. Uh, the execution engine, when it encounters a user task during the execution of a process, needs to give work to some user or multiple users. For that, it interacts with another component called a work list handler. So in a business process management system, when you talk about work list handler, is the place where users of the the workers in the process are gonna see the list of tasks that they currently need to be performed. These tasks are also called work items in the BPMS jargon. Uh, every business process management system comes with their own work list, which allows people to take tasks. But the majority of business process management systems allows you to interoperate with other task handlers like for example, Microsoft uh, uh, Outlook or SharePoint. So they will push tasks into your Microsoft Outlook uh, task list instead of providing you a web interface uh, or in addition to providing you a, a web interface. Uh, and, or or it, can, it, it can interact with different types of work handling systems. And finally, uh, the last component of a business process management system is the administration and monitoring tool. In some systems, particularly in Camunda, it is called the cockpit. And the cockpit 
uh, or administration tool is a place where you can see which processes are currently being executed, how many instances of each process are being executed, and you can deal, drill in and see the details of every one of those processes. Uh, those systems will typically give you like a burst eye view of your process, how many for each process that is executed, how many cases are currently ongoing, how many cases are on time, how many cases are late. And then from these type of interfaces, they allow you to, uh, an administrator of the, the process, to enter and start looking into the state of the process, for example, to figure out, hey, why is it that there is a, a purchase order here that is delayed by five days? What has happened? So you can drill down as an administrator and see exactly the state of that process instance, who is responsible for executing the next task, and you can then figure out why is it stuck there. Uh, finally, the BPMS is a box that interacts with other systems, enterprise resource planning systems, CRM systems, uh, manufacturing execution systems, etc., by means of application programming interfaces, APIs. Uh, a, 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 those are called external services in the BPMS terminology. BPMSs are a, a very well mature established technology um, used uh, by organizations worldwide, including some of the large organizations in Estonia and the Baltics. Um, a, there is a pretty large number of them. I cannot, cannot enumerate them all. A, to make licensing simpler, of course, we picked a commercial, a, a, an open source tool uh, for this course. This year, I picked a tool called Camunda. Um, it has a modeling editor, which is exactly the same as the one you have seen in Apromore, which means you can take process diagrams that you drew in Apromore and you can save them in .bpmn format and they are fully compatible uh, with Camunda. You can take them into Camunda on the other side. A, Camunda is a typical BPMS. You will find all the systems, all the modules that I showed you before. You will find a modeler. We talked about that. A, the modeler will then deploy the model into the engine. After you have deployed the model, the process model in the engine, uh, the engine will allow users to trigger instances of the process and to execute uh, instances of that process. Uh, know that in practice, uh, instances of, of a business process are not necessarily manually triggered by a user, but they are rather triggered by some external system. Typical company, for example, will receive purchase orders through a system called an electronic data interchange system, for example. It receives the or, or through its internet system, a, a, like, um, its online uh, e-commerce shop, for example, it then the system then can, when it receives an order, can create an instance of the uh, process in the business process management system through a programmatic call. And then the system, the business process, the execution engine then figures out what is the task that needs to be executed first and who needs to execute it, who is available to do it, and then puts that, that task into the task list of the corresponding person who needs to execute that task. And is keeping track of the execution of this task. Uh, and users at some point in time will indicate, yes, this task is performed, and the engine will determine who should get the next task. And then there is a cockpit for uh, visualizing the current state of the process and an administration interface to manage uh, users and groups and uh, give access rights to different people in the organization. All of these, of course, sitting on top of a database. Now, I need to, to show you, um, to give you a demo of Camunda, I need to switch to my laptop. I'll start the terminal window. And the first thing you need to do is to start the Camunda engine or Camunda server. I'm starting essentially the, the, uh, the system that 
is going to actually coordinate the execution of the process and that is going to provide me the, the cockpit where I can go and see the, 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 the execution of the process and also the task list, the default task list where end users perform their tasks. Uh, when this is done, I can check that my Camunda is, uh, is that the engine is there by going to localhost, uh, the port that Camunda uses, the Tomcat uses. And it looks like I am there. Okay. Now um, I need to start another terminal window, new window. And I need to, I will start by modeling a process. For that, I will open the, the modeler. And this is a process modeler, very similar to the one that you, that exactly the same actually that you see in a Promore. And you can draw a process model. And here I have drawn a little process model with only one task. So just as a starter. And this task is a user task. This is the symbol of a user task. And if I click on the, um, so to, to change the type of task, you can use this configuration button here. So you use this little icon and you say, this is a user task, uh, which I have already done anyway. Once you have defined that this is a user task, then you are able to uh, configure it. So I will select the task and I will uh, uh, define the, ex I define its name and I can define who is gonna execute this task. In here, I have specified here where I am highlighting that the task is executed by, is assigned to a group so I put in the candidate groups and the group is called the clerk. And I need to make sure that that group exists and has been defined in the administration console of the business process management system. I will show you later where to do that. There are, I can then assign forms in Camunda to specify the data that a task needs and that it returns you need to specify a form. This same specification is used by Camunda to generate a web form. Uh, but the most important part is that this is what tells to Camunda uh, what is the, the data that the user needs to enter during the execution of this task. So it's not so important um, that this is gonna be used to generate the UI, but what is important is that this is gonna be used to tell to the execution engine what is the data that is captured during the execution of this task? Or what is the data that you need to display to the user during the execution of the task? A form is composed of fields. For example, there is this, uh, uh, here I defined a field called input amount. And the input amount I specify is of a type long. You can, a field can be of type string. So any string or long, which is an integer. Boolean, which then makes it like a checklist, true, false, uh, or a date. And then you get like a calendar icon to specify a date or an enumeration, enum, which means you are, you're gonna specify a set of values. Like for example, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that could be an enumeration of possible values. So I specify that this, this task called A will has a form attached to it that consists of only one field called amount, which is of type integer. Uh, there are some other options that if you scroll down, you'll be able to uh, a, a, a specify, like for example, the default value, which I could specify and make it zero if I want, or 10 if I want. This is the, the value that this field has if the user does not enter anything. And so many other things you can specify in there, but I'll keep it at that. So I will save this process model, file, save. Well, the first time I say it asked me for a name and you can save it anywhere. You can save it in the desktop, it doesn't matter. Now this modeler is a bit special because it has this play button here at the top. And this play button 
is a functionality that the Camunda model provides that if in the same machine, in this case, in the same virtual machine, there is a Camunda engine running, then the modeler will push the model that is currently displayed into the execution engine. It will register it with the execution engine and it will allow you then to open it in the cockpit. So if I play, the process, is, the process uh, an instance of this process has been started. I'm sorry, I clicked two times in play. And so Camunda deployed the model in the engine and in addition, it started an instance of the process. And because I clicked on play twice, I now have two instances of the process running. Uh, I have um, defined it already. I'll, I'll first enter with demo just to show you. To make, to, to complete this process model, you need to specify this user group called clerk, and you need to, de to define a number of users of that type. Uh, that can be done via the groups, uh, via the, the Camunda administration console. So you go into the Camunda cockpit and you go into the administration part, and you can see that I have already here defined a user called clerk is enough to give it a name it's a name it's nothing more than a name and in the users tab i can specify i can add new users and i have already added a user with the id clerk small in small caps and the name of this guy is john clerk um so there is already a group called clerk and this in this process, the task A, I assign it to that group, and I already have a user of that group, of that team. So I'm basically ready to execute this process. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to log out, and I'm going to log in again as John Clerk with the user that I created just yesterday when I was preparing this, this demo. Uh, so I'm now... Uh, logged in as John Clerk, and I can go to, I am currently in the admin console, but I don't need to be there. Um, I can move to the cockpit and I can see which process instances are currently running. And I can see that there are three running instances. Probably I started one yesterday and I just started two today. And I can see these process instances. Uh, I can even see them in the diagram and seeing which state they are. Etc. Etc. The resolution is not great. So there are three instances and they are all waiting for task A to be executed. Well, let's go to my task list. This is my task list interface. So this is the interface that uh, workers will use to uh, uh, log into the system and look into it. Um, I see that I have three tasks to perform. They are all of type A. That's, that was the name of the task I defined it before. Uh, one was created yesterday when I was preparing this demo 16 hours ago. And two of them were created three minutes ago when I just accidentally clicked twice to create two new instances of the process. You will be able to click on a task in your task list and you will be able to perform the task, the work associated to this task. In a workflow management system, work is assigned typically to groups. You can assign it straight to a user, but most typically you assign it to a group. Let's say, for example, that in my organization, I have a group of credit officers or a group of clerks. There are usually 10 clerks. Um, and the system by default never assigns the work to one specific clerk because, oh, what happens if that clerk is sick today? Uh, so the, the poor invoice there will, will, will stay stuck. So the system assigns the work to the group. Then everyone in the group can see the work of the whole group. And if you, one of the group members say, I want to do this task now, then you have to, we call it check out the task. Or, but in Camunda it's called to claim the task. So you have to say, I, John Clerk, one of the clerks, I'm ready to do this task right now for this particular instance of this process. So I have to click on this button called claim. 
And then I'm saying, I am doing the task. So I do the task, I do blah, 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 blah. I give a phone call to the customer, et cetera, et cetera. I clarify a few things to the customer while I have claimed it, that no other team member can do this, this particular task in this instance. It's only me who can do it. And when I am done, then I say the amount is 50 or 59 and I complete the task and the task disappears from the work list. As you say, so I had three tasks before and I have one task now. They are not tasks really, they are task instances, what you're seeing there, also called as work items. Uh, the task is the same, A, but there are three different instances of this task that are occurring in three different instances of the business process I defined before. Okay, so that is, this is very rudimentary and the process I define is very simplistic. Uh, only one task and only assigned to a group and only one user of that group. Um, in the lab sessions, you will start doing exercises of increasing level of complexity. So the first exercise that you are doing, going to do in the lab session is you're going to add a gateway after the task and you are going to add a branching condition and you're going to specify that. If a condition is true, you go to one task. If a condition is true, you go another way. Um, and then you will then be asked to, to take a longer process and to start building up incrementally. There is one thing I know I have talked a lot and you might be sleeping, but if you are sleeping, please wake up. When we give you the homework for executable process modeling next week, Number one, we will start doing the homework in the practice session. So if there is one practice session to which you wanna go, is next week's one, because next week you will be starting with homework number five or homework number four, sorry, during the practice session. So it will be good that you are really there. Two, when you take a process model for automation and you are a beginner, so it's, like the first time you have used Camunda or maybe the second or the third, don't do the following. Do not model a whole process for three hours with 100 tasks and 50 gateways, and then start annotating user tasks, user tasks, user tasks, blah, 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 and then start putting all the forms in the tasks, and then the groups in the tasks, and then create 20 users and 10 groups, and then try if it works. If you do that, you will be incredibly frustrated because it won't work. It will not work. So there is going to be heaps of problems. There is going to be heaps of error message and you're gonna be you know, on top of Slack like, ah, it doesn't work and we are not gonna be able to help you because we don't know in which of your 100 tasks there is an error. So for the homework, please do it as follows. You start, from an empty diagram in Camunda, and you start drawing the first task as I did just now, and one field in that task, and then you test it, and then you see, yes, it's working. Then add the next, next task or gateway, and do it like two or three elements at a time. And every step, test it, test it, test it. Says, is there something you know you learn by doing software development? Is do a little bit test, do a little bit test, do a little bit test, um, and 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 if you find an error, then you will be able to know exactly where it comes from, and you will be able to better communicate it to us in Slack, and we'll be able to uh, hopefully help you uh, much better 